Caping Report, and I'm your host, Maureen Aylward. Our topic is accessibility in Rockport, and my guests are Leo Jagalian, a Rockport resident, Lisa Ogadas, Director of the uh, Disability Resource Center of the North Shore in Cape Ann, Bob Heineman, a Gloucester-based architect, and Joe Parisi, the Rockport DBW Director. Welcome to Cape Ann Report, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, on this most important subject, and uh, accessibility not only for people with disabilities but for all and since we're focusing on Rockport Joe I'm going to start with you as the DPW director and accessibility inside uh, homes can be done through work with architects um, but on the roads and the sidewalks is a different story so tell me more about what the DPW in Rockport is doing to improve accessibility? Well, we've done a number of road re improvements uh, throughout Rockport. Um, with each road improvement, we do focus on improvements uh, on the sidewalks as well. And um, we've got a number of roads connecting from the school right into downtown um, on Five Corners and into Granite Street. We have uh, handicap ramps that are, I think, um, helping with mobility issues and um, we hope to do more of that. We have actually a few complete street projects that we're looking to do. There's four projects that we have some concept plans on but the the idea is to create some uh, improvements for mobility for handicap ramps accessibility. Um, we will be doing actually our first one at the corner of um, Main and Beach Street and also uh, down at the Legion in uh, Back Beach. Mm -hmm. So those projects I, I think will certainly um, you know, be designed in the spring and we're hoping for the fall for construction. That's great. And so this Complete Streets program is a Massachusetts, it's a state program. It is. Actually it's a state uh, funded uh, grant program. We do have a list of projects we hope to do. Um, we have at least um, two or three that are sort of up front, but right. there are probably 10 or 12 of them that we could go through the list over time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Leo, uh, certainly you're using the streets and I wanted to um, ask you what your experience has been as a Rockport resident and using some of these new improvements, certainly. Uh, Leo, you're my neighbor yes. and so yes. um, yes. I see you go by and um, utilize uh, the ramps there. So what's been your experience? It's mixed. They're, the improvements that have been made have been great. The cut curbs, the, the easy ramps, you know, at the corners of the curbs or across these driveways and things, going from where I live on Summit Ave just to Dunkin' Donuts or to Ace Hardware or a little bit farther than that down to Cumberland Farms. Love those. And then going down King Street so I can get to Front Beach. All those improvements really help. So every little bit counts. Each street makes a big difference, and I look forward to just getting more access to more places as these projects come online. Where do you find the challenges uh, in accessibility or mobility uh, when you're um, heading down the street like King Street? So if I'm going down King Street, um, it can be just as soon as I get past the really nice part where the bank is and has been renovated and the curbs are all nice, then the curbs, the sidewalks could either be bumpy on the left side going down with a lot of divots that you feel everything in a wheelchair or in a baby carriage or in any other little like wheeled vehicle, you feel everything. And on the right side, there is no curb, but there's a sidewalk, but you'll see folks kind of edge up and park on the curb to give more room in the street. And those can be very tricky to get by in a wheelchair. And I imagine anyone who has walking difficulty also struggles there. Then once I get downtown, it's hit or miss with the shops. I will find places that I can go in, a couple of my favorite places, I have easy access. But then in others, I might have to wait outside and have a family member or my wife run in and grab something for me. And that's kind of a challenge because even a very small step, three inches, two inches, could be a problem in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, I wanted to ask you about that lack of access mm -hmm. because as the director of um, the Disability Resource Center, which is based in Salem, um, you must hear about these access issues a lot for businesses, I mean, these small businesses on Baskin Neck, for instance, with that just step up and mean 
Leo can't get into any right. of those. Well, what do you hear in your work? And it's a challenge because I think that, uh, as we've talked about, it is a very small uh, or town, and it's certainly very old architecture, so the challenges for accessibility are, are large. And what that cost involves, obviously, is a big concern. Uh, I think that what we're seeing, though, is that people who identify as having a disability, that population is growing. As we all age, we all have the opportunity to acquire disability. So these things become pervasive and they become a society problem. And so that's where we would provide as much advocacy as we could because people are being impeded mm -hmm. and people, all, everybody should have equal access. Everybody is important and should be counted. And so we should strive as much as we can to make all of our communities inclusive and accessible. What about this idea of universal access? Um, is that something that is discussed? Is it something like, Bob, as, a, as an architect, <laughs> you know, is that, that comes up in your work. And I'd like for everybody to comment on this idea of universal access since there's so many discrepancies and there's so many things that aren't really cross-referenced or connected. Um, and we'll get to some of the regulations in a minute, but Bob, yeah, no, it do does come up, that? and it's Yeah, uh, it's sort of a matter of scale. You know, newer, larger buildings, brand new buildings are by law uh, required to make their buildings accessible. And people are used to that um, in design and construction and building owners and all. But it gets trickier as you get into smaller scale and mm -hmm. as you mentioned with residential work um, and our older houses. I think I've given an example of improving our own mm -hmm. house in Gloucester built in 1740 and not exactly accessible with tiny little stairway and high risers and my wife and I are fortunate enough to be able to put an addition on the house and that's heightened my awareness of thinking about doorways mm -hmm. and uh, devices just uh, handheld uh, grab rails and um, for people, I think, with, um, with an older house, it, it really sometimes makes a difference between whether their parents or themselves can stay in that house uh, as they age and, and may regretfully not, not want to move into a long-term care facility, but are more or less forced to mm -hmm. by that sort of thing. So I think, I think there is a, a, a much greater heightened awareness as people live longer and realize that I better open my eyes and <laughs> develop some acuity about this. Is universal access out of reach or? I don't think it is. I think that uh, mm. what I think most people residentially find the two barriers, the biggest barriers are stairs and bathroom, uh, the access to the bathroom, to the shower. Uh, and I think that there are, with technology and new things out there, there's mm -hmm. a lot of ways to retrofit. Uh, they have the chairlifts that you can install so that you can get from your first floor to your second. Uh, there are some, sim some simple, less expensive fixes to a bathroom access. And you had discussed the suction cup uh, railings. That's very inexpensive. They're easy to install and they're super helpful because you can place them where you physically reach. Uh, another thing that people often do, they have what they call tub cuts. So you can have your existing bathtub uh, and there are several organizations that will come in and actually cut out a piece of it and seal it. And they still give you that little piece. So if you ever sold the house, you could put it back. Uh, but that is tremendous access for folks. So mm -hmm. when we look at universal access, we, we look at the physical, we also look at caregiving and uh, resources that are in our communities that we can bring in because we all want to age at home. Uh, and it is, you know, obviously people have ingrained in their communities, they want to stay in their homes, but there are simple ways to create a more accessible home. It is hard, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. to be able to build an addition is, is a super wonderful thing. Not everybody can do that, but when you look at the small things that you can incorporate into your home. Mm -hmm. Leo, you went mm -hmm. through a renovation in your home and started yeah. this conversation about universal access. What was your experience? Yeah, well, we worked with an architect who mentioned that term, and I thought it was a great term. And I think anyone who is doing an addition or making some type of a modification, I think universal access. In, in a sense, it's like, okay, is it wheelchair accessible? But I think of it more like, is it accessible for moms with baby carriages? So my wife, we have grandchildren now, the ramp we put in for a wheelchair is great for having the kids over and having, getting in and out of the house. Wider doorways, handles, doorknobs on handles. Instead of doorknobs, they're handles that you can grab and turn easier. 
it makes it so much easier for everyone and i think that if anyone is thinking about doing some type of a renovation or an addition think of it as as universal accessibility one it might be able to allow you to stay in that home longer it it allows people who are visiting you whether young or old to get in and out much easier and much more i don't know accessibly so mm -hmm. i think it's a it's a great concept and I wish I had known about it years and years ago. Um, Joe, what is the town talking about? Well, the, the town um, is recognizing that as well. I think we've done a number of projects that, um, you know, have improved access, universal access. The community house is a great example, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been an older building that was, uh, you know, renovated probably eight years ago now, but um, still a project that, a uh, building that allows um, universal access into it. You know, there's a ramp that leads up to it. There's an elevator in it, the handles on the doors, all of that. And I think whenever we do a building, that's what we're putting into our buildings. Mm -hmm. I mean, town hall? So you get a ramp going downstairs? We have a ramp at town hall. We have the elevator, elevator in there. I mean, it's an older building that probably could use a little bit more um, work in that regard. But I think as, you know, we go forward though, in, in do spend money on our buildings, that's definitely going to be included in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. so. Is a mandate? Uh, certainly regulations um, exist uh, to do this. Correct. And so how do you approach it if there's a building that needs? Well, it's all in the design. I mean, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're meeting the code and that you're incorporating, you know, what is necessary into, you know, all aspects of the design, whether it be ramps or, you know, hardware for the doors. Mm -hmm. But it's just something that needs to be done and we, we do do it. Um, as we put the money into the buildings, that's, that's the improvements that we're looking at as well. Mm -hmm. What about businesses? Um, you know, there are a lot of small businesses in Rockport, and as we uh, mentioned earlier, some small businesses like on Beskin Neck do not have the ability or the, um, I don't know how to put that, but, um, you know, the inclination perhaps to make their shops accessible. So what's standing in the way of businesses? Uh, Lisa, I guess that's a question for you. What's standing in the way of businesses making their, um, their shops accessible to you? Some of it is physical. Some of it is there are certain regulations about how much, how steep the grade is for a ramp, what kinds of rails need to be in place, what kind of turn space needs to be in mm -hmm. place, and all those things are real physical barriers. So a lot of those shops are really little. And so that's, that's a big challenge. And obviously financial, uh, be able to afford to have the renovations done is always a challenge. Uh, so it's really, it's twofold. And it's unfortunate, it, you know, it is a product of the wonderful community that we live in, but there, there are some real barriers in place. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, could mm -hmm. you tell us a story about your experience at Harvard University? That's both, uh, you know, of course, you know, an educational institution, but an employer and a historic campus. Sure. So could you tell us that? Because I think that that illustrates a lot of uh, these challenges that yeah, I, I think it represents a bit the sort of history and evolution mm -hmm. of implementing uh, the ADA. The first job I had as an architect back in the 70s was with the Harvard University Planning Office. And I'd only been there a few months when the ADA was suddenly announced. And Harvard um, and <clears throat> all the other institutions, particularly with historic buildings, were um, somewhat surprised and shocked that this was serious mm. and it needed to be implemented. And uh, my job was to go around and look at all the campus buildings and try to figure out ways that they could be made uh, accessible. And they typically, the typical design in those days was a set of stairs going up and um, Harvard was not receptive to the idea of changing the historic facades and the solutions tended to be more toward the on the back side right, of the building yeah. where there might have been a lower level loading dock or access mm -hmm. to eating facilities and that became a real problem of ethics where people that needed accessibility were considered second-class citizens mm -hmm. and um, it took some time I had left and gone on to other pursuits, but um, I know that people finally, part of it is just status quo, and well, we've always done it this way, and what's the big problem? And there is a real learning and growth experience for, for everybody. I, th I think to your comment about stores, and we all live with 
clutter in our homes and we're sort of not awareness, aware of it and someone will come in and say, gee, if you moved that table over, your room would look twice as big and perhaps the shop owners are just used to um, mm -hmm. their inventory being in the way of, of entrance and it's somewhat awareness and just um, sort of spreading the word, I think, about mm -hmm. and small things that could be done just to, to make life easy. Lisa, what's mm -hmm. your reaction to that story? Oh, it's, it's typical. I think <laughs> that one of the good things is that as we come along in society, I think the, um, the acceptance and, and the reality that we all have the opportunity to acquire a disability and that our population is aging, so accessibility is, is all-encompassing. And I think that we have seen a progression in our society with accessibility. Uh, both physical and also acceptance and, and integration. Uh, and we've seen that in a lot of different levels. So it's encouraging. And yes, there are still plenty of barriers out there, uh, both physically and attitudinally, that are a big barrier for folks. But uh, it, we just got to keep slugging along, making these small improvements, understanding what the steps are to get where we want to go, uh, and look at how we can look at grants, how we can look at funding sources, and also community helpers uh, to create a better inclusive society. Leo, what recommendations mm -hmm. do you have for businesses? Well, I think it would be, um, think about people you know. I think about either elderly people, your parents, your grandparents, friends, colleagues, people that you know who have injuries of some sort, people who have illness of some sort. Put yourself in their shoes. They don't necessarily have to be in a wheelchair, but then have them, you're in their, in their mindset and they're trying to navigate your space, right? So maybe you can't retrofit a store to get a wheelchair inside, but maybe it's not a wheelchair you have to accommodate. It's someone with a cane, right? It's someone who just doesn't have good balance, right? This, so there are lots of folks, if you go down in the summer and you're on bare skin neck, you see people walking down there you see a lot of people struggling to walk really well for different reasons. It could be an injury, it could just be a back problem, it could be a knee problem, it could be some other thing other than a, a, a disability like someone being in a wheelchair. And you'll see that, geez, a lot of the shops are tough and it could just be, you know, a little more room inside the store, as you said, you know, making sure there's room to get in and move around. And so think about that. Think about who you know who struggles with mobility in some way or another, and then how does your space, whether in your house or in your shop or you know, somewhere outside downtown, either blocks their ability to get by. And so I go back to something I mentioned to a bunch of folks is on, on walking down a sidewalk where a car is pulled up on the curb a little bit, it doesn't just block a person in a wheelchair, it blocks anyone who's walking, a mom with a stroller, or someone who just has, you know, walking down the street with a friend, you know, mm -hmm. so. Um, Lisa, does your organization have resources for businesses or uh, We certainly employers? do. Uh, one of the things we actually have is a, a service on what we call the All People Accessible Business. We will actually go out to organizations, and we've done a variety on Cape Ann, go in and do like a, what we call an ADA light survey, just to give that shopkeeper or restaurant an idea of little things they could do, you know, just to make it more user friendly. What does your parking lot look like? What does your, you know, a typical example of that is your bathrooms. You know, and you may not be able to completely renovate your bathrooms, but could you put a soap dispenser and a, a basket of napkins down instead of way up high? Or those little things that can be done mm -hmm. uh, to be able to create a more accessible experience for folks so that people can really come and enjoy your uh, organization, your restaurant. It's going to increase your patronage. Uh, certainly, you know, if everybody is included and, you know, able to access, they're going to go where they feel welcome. And so that could do nothing but improve a business. Mm -hmm. Joe, any thoughts mm -hmm. on, on that? Well, I, I think there's a lot of um, changes that the town um, certainly can uh, move forward with. And we're thinking about different things. In fact, a, a good example would be um, Evans Field. We have an access ramp that we're going to be designing to Evans Field and um, open up you know, that field as well to um, those that have mobility issues. So I think, um, yeah, it's always something that you've got to 
keep in mind and you know think about what you can do to make things better. Curbs that you know don't really have a nice vertical face, cars can really climb up mm -hmm, on them mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. easier. So you know replace your curbs with a with a hard faced granite or asphalt. Mm -hmm. You know don't make it easier for cars to jump up on there. But uh, yeah, those are the types of things you got to do and got to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, another question for you is regarding the the crosswalk or the cross reference with the ADA and mm -hmm. Massachusetts business a uh, building code. The, the building, yes, building the regulations code. in Massachusetts predate. <clears throat> the Americans with Disability Act uh, regulations. So they are older. And so there is some legislation pending that would address that, that would likely create the situation where the Massachusetts regulations would come into alignment with the ADA regulations. And that is important because right now, if a business or organization renovates and um, they have to come up to code within Massachusetts, they do not have to come up to code to the ADA. So what that means is that they have to make their accessibility only to the point where their customers have access. But any of their employees, they do not. So uh, that means people who have disabilities may or may not be able to get a job there. And so again, that is discrimination, and it shouldn't be in this day and age. It's it, it's not necessary. Certainly, there's a big push against that uh, regulation um, legislation uh, from a variety of you know organizations because they fear how much money it would cost. But really, it wouldn't cost that much money. There have been studies done that show that it would not make a significant financial impact. Uh, so we would like to support that regulation. We have an ongoing support advocacy going on at, at right now with uh, the legislation of Massachusetts. This has been a dogfight. It's been going on for like 15 years, uh, but we're going to be persistent as an organization and as a statewide advocacy group to kind of push that forward. What's holding it back? 15 years? This legislation seems to be a no-brainer. You would think. It, right? Yeah. And it seems it sounds like the ethical thing to do here. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? Lobbying? Lobbying. Lobbying, Lobbying by, uh, for some of the realtor organizations and things like that um, because they are afraid of, of the expense and having that piece of it. So they have deep pockets and so there is a lot of pressure from you know outside agencies mm -hmm. and resources. Sounds like so, it's time for that to change. We would hope. Goodness. <laughs> um, and staying on the topic of employers, uh, employers, as you mentioned, don't necessarily have to make changes Correct. to their, uh, their offices. Mm -hmm. um, what can employers do to be more proactive in addressing this for employees who are disabled in order for them to get a job? You mentioned the unemployment rate. Is, the unemployment the rate is in somewhere around 63% for, for people with disabilities versus mm -hmm. right now, what is it, 3% if that? Right. So it's a crime, really. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you look at what that means, what does that impact? That impacts um, the state of Massachusetts because of benefits that are paid out for folks who can't get a job, uh, who maybe have SSI or SSDI because they, they don't have an accessible place to go work. Uh, so financially, just within the state, it makes sense to be able to create a more accessible environment for folks. But it is just understanding that also, you have the right to ask for reasonable accommodations as a person with a disability and whether it's a visible or an invisible disability because there are a lot of technical different types of disabilities that are invisible you wouldn't necessarily know. Uh, but it also, so we work with a lot of our consumers about understanding to be able to self-advocate for uh, things that they need and to ask for reasonable accommodations and also work with different types of employers to kind of educate them about the missed opportunity and resources that are out there for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Leo, uh, you have a job and mm -hmm. how was your employer, uh, was that was the employer they were great. willing they were great. to make some changes yes, for you? Yes, reasonable accommodation, exactly. So once you have someone in a wheelchair, door openers, so remote door openers, they, they installed those, they, they, they modified a bathroom to make it more accessible. Again, a door opener, but then certain grab bars that I needed. And then a sink, right? So most people think, oh, if the seat's the right, if a sink is the right height, it must be accessible. But it isn't because you have to be able to get your knees under the sink. And most people don't think of approaching a sink in a seated position. So they've done a lot of things like that that have made it much easier, made it, made it uh, possible for me to be at my job um, otherwise, I could probably do my job at home, but when you don't have 
face-to-face -face interaction with people, it's harder to really get your job done. You shouldn't done, have so. to work at home. You yeah. should yeah. have every right that everybody else has. That's right. That's right. It's and nice that, when you can, though. It's nice when you can. Take a couple can, days here and there. Which is but, lovely. Right. Yeah. But the other piece of that is that organization is lucky to have you, a long-term employee, with all of that knowledge and uh, experience to be able to give back to that organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. How do we break the logjam yeah. of people with disabilities in the workplace? Is it just these regulations or the ADA compliance, I mean? Um, is that what's holding things back? Like, I don't mm -hmm. think so. I think it, beyond that, I think it's attitudinal. I think people are worried uh, when they hire someone with a disability about um, their attendance or their performance or just a fear of what that disability is. We all have preconceived uh, ideas about what that person looks like because we're so, unless we understand and are you know, in touch with people with disabilities, you can come away with your own personal judgment uh, about what that's going to be and who that person is when you haven't even met that person. So mm -hmm. part of it is fear, I think, on some of the employer's part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Leo, that's a really yeah. good point. My wife says when she, <laughs> she'll talk to me or she'll talk to friends and she'll say, see the man, not the chair. See the man, not the chair. Mm -hmm. And they do. I mean, once you get to know someone who has a disability, you talk to them, they're a regular person. They have the same needs and wants and, and feelings that everyone else does, and there's no harm in it. So I've worked with so many great people over the years, and everyone has been very accommodating and very helpful. And you find that when you have a disability, or whether it's a temporary disability like an injury, people are generally super helpful and super accommodating. And it's, it's refreshing because most of the things you read in the newspaper and what's going on in the world, you think, oh, people are terrible, but they're not. They're mostly mm -hmm. accommodating and helpful, and I've worked with so many good people over the years, and I have such great family and friends. They all help out with anything, so mm -hmm. um, that's what you need. It's good to see. Mm -hmm. We'll look forward right. to seeing um, more improvements on the sidewalks and roads in Certainly. Rockport, and thanks for the information on aging in place, very important, and Lisa and Leo, thank you for your insights. Um, that's all the time that we have on Cape Inn Report. Thanks for tuning in and watching. Until the next time, take care.